Good morning. My name is Doug Meyer. I'm one of the associate pastors here with you guys. You know, I got to tell you, we thought it would be really simple to find cute signs. And there are a bunch of cute ones. And then there are a bunch that are not family appropriate. I don't know if you've driven by churches that have that out there or not, but we're like, ooh, we can't put that up there. Of course, we were very tempted to because we're ornery, but uh, I'm glad you're here today. I know some of you came with a little bit of fear and trepidation. I had some friends who actually said, love you, not coming. <laughs> you know, this has been a, a, just a prickly topic, hadn't it? Right? And I got to tell you, it's kind of funny. God has just this God sense of humor that's bigger than all of creation. We planned this series uh, months ago, probably now. And we, uh, we look at the, the schedule and we look at hey, is this a good subject to talk about on back to school Sunday or this not and this and that? And then we look at preacher schedules and just we take everything into account. And so, um, well, lo and behold, your truly gets to preach this subject. And all the while, I'm confident that some of you all in God were snickering. Why, you ask? Because I have been, over the last year or so, one of the greatest offenders of uh, mouthing off, if you would, into this subject. I, uh, I'm not proud of that. I'm in uh, a series of uh, Facebook recovery groups uh, <laughs> because of that. And I uh, am trying very hard to uh, bridle my passion, combine my energy and my brain at the same time. Do any of y'all know somebody who kind of get that confused at times? And man, I just want to stand up for this or that. And so I will bravely post something on Facebook. That shows great courage, doesn't it? Well. Not so much. But um, perhaps today we can all grow a little bit further down the road together. That's, that's my hope. We're not going to uh, fix everything. This is a long, involved subject that is not new to us in the last uh, election cycle or last cycle where you've gotten along or not with folks you do life with. One of the texts that is kind of a, a, a core for me, and, and perhaps it is for you as well, is what we're going to start with. If you uh, turn to your app, turn to your bulletin, turn to uh, the Bible in your pew, and join me, we're going to open with two different scriptures. The first one was penned by Brother Paul to the church in Rome, and I think for many of us it is, um, it is almost a daily lament. I know it certainly is for a number of 13-year-olds. Hear now the word of God. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin. Here we go, folks. Listen up. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Anybody said that already today? I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing thing I hate. That moment, that, that uh, clash of no better, do better, has been kind of my mantra, as long as I can remember. That was uh, a phrase that my, uh, my beloved dad would say, Douglas, I expect you to know better to do better. My life is full of those sayings of my dad in my ears. Flip with me now over to Ephesians. Ephesians 4. Another great book from Paul. Hear now the word of the Lord. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger, and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Wow. We could just kind of make that the main course of life, couldn't we? How many of us uh, can testify with our hand on or not the Bible that we do our very best? Isn't this where we so often get ourselves into trouble? Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up. How are, how are you at a building 
Are you a building upper? That's heavy stuff. So this morning, with both that lament and that charge, we're going to walk straight into two worlds that we all live in day in and day out. We're going to look a little bit at what politics means. We're going to look at a little bit of what it means to be a Christian. And then we're going to tread into the weeds or the woods, the high road or the low road, about what happens when something snaps and we forget who we are. Politics. Oh, my goodness. Politics. Some of you were afraid that all I was going to do is rant and rave today about Republican or Democrat or blue state or red state or conservative or liberal. Well, you're kind of right, because in reality, politics covers all of us all the time. As I was uh, researching some for this sermon, I, I went on the internet because I knew I would be able to find the perfect definition of politics. It ain't out there. Why? Because politics covers such a wide spectrum of settings and situations. There are politics involved, I believe, wherever two or more are gathered, well, you're going to find politics. I did, though, come up with what I think is a pretty concise little definition. It says, uh, politics, the use of power, influence, and resources to accomplish a goal. That is it at its broadest terms. And my effort this morning is to talk about politics in its broadest terms. Of course, I had to bring that down just a little bit. Here's my version. Using power, influence, or resources to get a person or a group to do what I want them to do, to accomplish what I or perhaps we believe is needed or in the best interest or for the greater good. You got that? So now think again with me about where, um, can you think of a place where politics does not exist? It's everywhere, right? It is uh, probably in your office, if you work in an office with one or more people. It's in um, Chamber of Commerce. It's in uh, the Neighborhood Association. It's in the Garden Club, even. It's in uh, schools. It's in government, village, city, county, state, nation, globe. Anywhere that people pursue a greater good and they get there by using power, influence, and resources, well, that's politics, right? So are we in agreement that everything we do, everywhere we go, is somehow impacted by top politics, right? I got gotcha. you. Give me a little something, something. Yes or no? I, I make believe that you said yes. <laughs> Christians. Christians. Well, here we are, right? That's an easy one, because all Christians are just alike. Isn't that great? They're not? So again, I go to the good old internets, and I look for Christians. Wow. We, wow. Be careful what you type in the internet. Christians. Church-going folk, right? Church-going folk on Christmas, Easter, and Mother's Day. Christians who tithe. Christians who don't. Is it that? Is it more than that? Yeah, it is. So this morning what we're going to do is we're going to talk about Christians in a very specific way, how you and I live. And what I've chosen to define as a Christian is those of us who have chosen to live fully into a life-redeeming relationship with Jesus Christ. Those of us who have chosen to live into a life-redeeming relationship with Jesus Christ. It is faith-filled, it is faith-guided, and it is Scripture-inspired. Is that all Christians? Maybe, maybe not. But I'm going to try really hard, as much as I'm inclined to, to not judge. We read the scriptures of the Old and New Testament, and we are guided and inspired by them. On occasion, we will even think long and hard about the prayer that we say every Sunday, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So there we have it. Politics and Christians. Are we doing all right? Are we kind of on the same page? Well, good. Because then comes life. Then comes life. 
many of you all know, because I talk about them a lot, I'm very blessed to be able to do a lot of life with my granddaughters. Nora, who's going into kindergarten, and Audrey, who is going into third grade. One of the very favorite things we do when we spend time together is we go to a little park down the street from their house, and one of the things that park has is an incredible sandbox. Who in here loves the sandbox? Most kids do, most parents hate it because all of that sand does what? Comes back home. But you know what? That's one of the joys of being a papa. I don't have to worry about that. So we go to the sandbox pretty regularly. And the other day we were there and this sermon was mulling around in the back of my mind and I thought, you know, the sandbox and life, they're not much different, really. Most everybody gets along most of the time in the sandbox. Why? Because they have shared goal. Move the dirt from this side of the sandbox to that side of the sandbox to make this pile of sand or that pile of sand. To dig a hole, to bury a truck, to bury a tennis shoe, to bury a kid. It's very simple. It's straightforward. That's why you're what? You're at the sandbox to play in the sand. There are some rules, though. You have to share whatever is in the sandbox. Their uh, sandbox has this great big dump truck lever thing, and it's a really cool toy, and all the kids want to use it. But as my sweet, uh, sweet Norris says, Papa, that little boy is hogging, hogging the scoop. She and I know what that means. Y'all might know what that means. Hogging the scoop means you're taking more than your share of time at the scoop. The kids in the sandbox know how much time is appropriate to use at the scoop. And they will be quick to tell you, you're hogging the scoop. The other thing that happens in the sandbox is if you bring a toy, it is implied that you're going to share it. If you can't share it, don't bring it. That's their rule. There are some moms and dads who get that wrong at times. But if you live in the sandbox, it is known that if you bring that toy, that truck, that scoop, that bucket, if it's in the sandbox, it's fair game. Everybody gets along, everybody's welcome. Newcomers are always welcome to come in and join the fun in the sandbox. That's kind of how life is, right? But there is one, no, actually two, die hard, die hard rules about the sandbox. You know them, you have suffered through them. No throwing, no kicking. If you do, you will get ejected from the sandbox. Friends, any of that sound like life today? On our best days, we bring our toys to the sandbox and we do pretty well, don't you think? I think we do. I'm kind of a, uh, a pie in the sky. Some would call me a bruised optimist. I think for the most, most of the time, most of us are doing the best we can. I choose to believe that. We treat people with respect, with kindness, and compassion. We apply those things we learned in Sunday school or Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or Vacation Bible School. And then it happens. There is there's a snap. That moment that sand did get thrown in your eyes or somebody snatched their toy because you weren't playing with it or you were playing with it too long and it was time for it to go back to its, to its rightful owner. And then all heck breaks out, right? It all breaks out. We who are church-going Christians act as if we never read the guidelines, the book, or sat through a sermon. Through our words and our actions are our affirmation of other people's words or actions. Oh, mercy. What has happened to us who call ourselves Christians? Yeah, but... He said, she said, it wasn't my fault. Words that echo through the sandbox, but words also that echo through the mouths of us who call ourselves Christians. Friends, as one of your pastors and one of your friends, I am here this morning to ask you and to prod me to stop, to learn how to play nice in this sandbox we call our world. We are damaging people. We are destroying people. We are tearing people apart who uh, we say on Sundays that we love because they're our neighbor. 
And then we go out into the world and we cast stones, or we pick a stone that was cast and we hurl it back with twice the force and twice the fury. Turn with me, if you could, to Galatians 6, 6, 9. You know, this book is full of really good stuff. Have y'all read this lately? It's amazing. Galatians 6, 9. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all. The good of all. And especially for those of the family of faith. Let's look at that kind of up close for just a minute. For the good of all. All. Like, who gets to pick all? All in my neighborhood, all I like, all I don't... All... That's such a powerful word for just three little letters, right? A-L-L, all. Even uh, the lunatics in Charlottesville. Gosh, I hate it when God asks me to love somebody I don't like. Let us not grow weary. Maybe that's the other problem. Have we just, are we just tired? Have we, have we done so much good that we have just grown weary of doing good and we need a good break? That's what it is, right? I'm sure that's... That's what it is. We're tired of listening and being patient and showing tolerance and kindness and forgiveness. We're just worn out from being so darn good. It's summer. It's just hard to be good in the summer. Yeah, we've got to get this straightened out. As Andy Stanley said recently, really at the height of the election, he looked out in this congregation and he said, Adults, pay attention. And they all looked at him. He said, Stop it. You're scaring the kids. Wow. You mean the kids are watching us? These little guys who we just baptized, they're watching how we... Oh, wow. Uh-oh. You mean they're going to someday do what we did because they saw mom and daddy or grandma and grandpa treat their neighbor that way? How did we get where we are? By forgetting that the kids are watching. So, let's say you really made a mess in the sandbox and your mama or your daddy or grandpa snatched you up by your collar and said, we're going home. So you did that long walk of shame from the sandbox home. And in our little world, what that means is you get to go to timeout. Anybody here go to timeout lately? I spent half my life in timeout. So, so, uh, my dad would say, Douglas, you know, it was always bad if your full name, Douglas, go to your room and think about what you've done. Dang, I hated thinking about what I'd done. Because I did have a conscience, and I do have a conscience. And I knew the minute that door shut, <sighs> I have to think about what I have done. Perhaps that's why we are here today. Perhaps that is our invitation this afternoon. Go to your room and think about what you have done. And then you wake up you realize you have been so lost in the weeds, you really didn't even know where the exit was. So this morning, I want to give us just a couple of simple steps to wrap up with. Uh, imagine you're in timeout. Imagine you have some moments to think about how you as a Christian have entered into this life of political this and that, whether it is at home or the office or the band booster club or the athletic club or the cheerleader squad. You name it, it is full of opportunity to live less than you're supposed to. Confess to one other person how you've been messing up. Allow one other person into your world to hold you accountable for being less than what God has asked you to be. Just one other person. Just one other person. Invite them into your life to say, you know, the next time I go off on a rant, can you please gently stop me before I complete my sentence and make a total jerk of myself? Can you whisper in my ear, honey, right now would be a good time to shut up? Can you drop me a note? Can you shoot me a text that says, you're doing that thing that you asked me to tell you when you're doing that thing? Let one other person into your life to hold you accountable. And then as is the case in most good timeouts, you're also grounded. 
You are grounded today from your phone. Just go home, unplug it, put it away. Do not go on social media. Do not rant or rave, discuss or disgust. Anything for one whole day. Oh, and by the way, no TV either. And if you don't do this, no bluebell. Friends, we get caught up in this instantaneous commentary opinionated world that gives us this free forum to be less than. Very seldom do you see on any of these social media situations bold affirmations, bold examples of people living faithfully into being kind and caring and tender and tolerant. Friends, we, we know better, don't we? The question is, can, can we do better? And it's kind of tough. Um, the ones I have the toughest time with are the people, like I said, that I don't like. I look at the TV and the hate in Charlottesville, and there was a couple of moments I go on to God just to smite people. Good news is, God, I don't believe God's a smiter. But I, I'm supposed to pray for those folks regardless of what flag they're carrying, right? Hmm. I'm supposed to pray every day for all the leaders in our nation. I don't do that, but I should. And I'm going to start. How can I criticize somebody that I don't also lift up to God to say, God, guide them, lead them, keep them safe? I hope you will join me in trying to do better in this regard. Why? Because that's what we're called to do. And secondly, as Andy Stanley said, you're scaring the kids. One last thing before you can get out of time out. I want you to write these phrases a hundred times today and turn them in tomorrow. Good penmanship. Cursive. Matthew 22. Love your neighbor as what? So you know how it goes. Love your neighbor as yourself a hundred times. Cursive. Then lastly, Isaiah 117, 200 times. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Let's pray. Gracious and holy God, we need your help. You have taught us. You have sent your Son to be our living example of what it means to learn to do right, to seek justice, to walk humbly. God, we pay attention some of the time, and we do it some of the time, especially when it's easy. Help us, O oh God. We need your strength. In Jesus' name, amen.